Okay, well, thanks very much for inviting me. Um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to, to come here, um, awful long way from New Zealand. Um, and it's great to meet Bo. And, uh, you know, we've been meeting for the last 20 years or so in Kamla, so it's nice to meet him on his home turf. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, the Rossi toothfish fishery um, and how Kamla are trying to balance uh, what they call rational use or sustainable fishing with conservation. So the, um, the toothfish fishery is um, undoubtedly contentious. And there have been a, a number of articles in the media and scientific papers and newspapers and so forth over the last few years talking about the, or questioning the sustainability of the fishery. So, um, for example, there was a paper in Nature in 2010, um, fishing down the food web of the Antarctic continent, Polar Research 2013, question, people questioning the... Um, how precautionary is the policy governing the Ross Sea toothfish fishery, Antarctic science, uh, 2014, and then uh, just even in our local newspaper in, in Nelson, vulnerable fish found in the bargain bin. So today I want to give you some, um, some of the uh, science behind the debate and, and how Kamala really does try to, to balance conservation with rational use in the Ross Sea fishery. In what is a, it is an international fishery and there are difficulties obviously associated with that. Okay, so um, Bo has already talked a little bit about, um, about CAMLA. Um, so it stands for the Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. Um, and it's all about conserving and managing Antarctic uh, living resources. So it doesn't exclude, I mean, it excludes whales and, and seals, which are managed by other conventions, but it does include sp the fish species and, and things like krill and uh, crabs. So uh, con conservation within the Kamlar Convention is uh, defined as including rational use. Um, and so the convention requires that we balance these competing interests of, of rational use, but also conservation. Um, as Bo said, there's 25 odd uh, member nations. Uh, most of them have bases in, in Antarctica, have a, a long interest in Antarctica. Um, it includes the, most of the, the major countries in the world, really. Um, US, China, Russia, many of the European countries, and, and also the southern hemisphere countries which are um, close to Antarctica itself. Um, so within CAMLA, the, uh, the main decision-making body is Commission and uh, it's advised by a scientific committee and um, its technical scientific working groups. Um, they have an annual cycle of science meetings and they're usually meeting around now in October um, for a period of four weeks. Um, so I'm missing that one missing that meeting for the first time in about 20 years. So. <laughs> um, and interestingly, the, the membership includes both fishing and non-fishing nations. So there's probably a, a split about 50-50 between fishing nations and, and non-fishing nations. Um, Kamla advocates a strong precautionary or ecosystem approach to fisheries management and was one of the first uh, international organi organizations really to, to think about ecosystem-based fisheries management. And a lot of that was, was based on the krill fishery and the concern that the krill fishery would have on all the predators of krill around Antarctica. So that was a, a strong reason why they had that mandate to begin with. Um, those two bottom points are, are really important. All decisions are made by consensus, which means everyone has to agree, and that's very difficult. Um, but the decisions are only binding on the member countries, so that gives rise to the possibility that other vessels can go in and fish Antarctic waters, which when their, their um, governments aren't signed up to Kamla, so that sort of gives rise to the IUU fishing issues there. Okay, so um, a little bit about the two fish. I think Bo and, and um, Joe have already touched on uh, the toothfish species, so there's two of them. There's the Patagonian toothfish, uh, or sorry, I'll start with the Antarctic, Antarctic toothfish. Uh, they occur adjacent to the Antarctic continent. As Joe said, they have uh, antifreeze in their blood and can tolerate very cold water down to, to minus two degrees. Um, in contrast, the Patagonian toothfish occur slightly further north in the warmer subantarctic waters. Um, and I'll show you distribution maps in a minute of these two species. Um, both species are very large, up to two meters long. 
um, and, and up to 150 kilos. Um, they have moderate growth rates. Um, they tend to be late maturing, so maturing about 12 to 15 years of age, um, and have a maximum age of around 50 years. Um, they're very, very high value species. They call them black gold. Um, they're caught by bottom long line, although they do occur at times in, in mid water, and that alludes to the neutral buoyancy that, um, that Joe mentioned earlier. Um, within the Ross Sea fishery itself, uh, around 99% of the catch is Antarctic toothfish, so primarily a, an Antarctic toothfish fishery. So this shows the distribution of the two toothfish species, and this is based on, on catch data from fishing vessels. Um, unfortunately, I can't really show you the... If for some reason this isn't working, but um, the, uh, the, the main um, species... Um, ah, move one there. OK, thanks. OK. OK. So, um, so the, you can see the yellow here is the Antarctic toothfish. This is the, the Ross Sea fishery, which I'm talking about today. But they occur in patches all the way around, um, all around Antarctica. Um, the, uh, Patag the Patagonian fishery uh, is mainly around South Georgia. So there's a big fishery there, two to 3,000 tons a year. Um, other big fisheries here um, around Kerguelen Island, which is a part of the French EZ, and uh, uh, Heard and MacDonald Island, which is part of the Australian EZ. Um, and you can see that the two species overlap in, in certain areas. Here around the, the South Sandwich Islands, um, the two species overlap here at Bouvet, um, here on uh, Banzari Bank and, and, and here in the Ross Sea. And in those areas, the two species can be caught on the same, the same long line. Um, in terms of genetics, um, the, uh, there's been quite a lot of genetic studies on, on both Patagonian and Antarctic toothfish. And in general, they show very low genetic diversity. Um, we tend to consider them within, within CAMLA. Uh, we tend to be managed as separate fisheries. So in um, the Ross Sea, this is a, a particular fishery here, the 881 um, Ross Sea fishery. Over here, we've got the uh, Amundsen Sea fishery. And so we tend to have a, a different fishery for each of the, of the subdivisions or, or areas. But in reality, it's probably one large uh, metapopulation here in the the Pacific stock, the Indian Ocean stock, and the Atlantic stock. Hopefully this will work. So, um, is that going to work? Oh. Yeah, Thomas said this might not work, which would be a bit of a shame. Um, so this was going to be <laughs> the, some of the first underwater footage of an uh, Antarctic toothfish that was shot on um, McMurdo Sound and around five or 600 metres. Um, and this is a, a clip of about a, a metre uh, of about a minute long where we've got up to four um, very large Antarctic toothfish swimming around a, a baited underwater video bait. So it's a bit of a shame that's not... Um, unless it might, yeah, it's a bit of a shame it's not working. Never mind, perhaps we can show them at the lunch break or something. Um, so a little bit about the Ross Sea toothfish fishery. Um, it is an Olympic fishery. All the, Atlant all the Antarctic fisheries are Olympic fisheries, which means that it's a race to catch the fish um, by individual vessels until the, the catch limit is reached. Um, so the fishery was first developed by uh, a, couple of, a New Zealand company early in the 1990s, uh, sorry, 1997 and then subsequently increased to uh, three to four vessels, um, vessels from other nations um, into the fishery in 2003. Um, and now there's a fleet of around um, 15 to, to 20 vessels in any one particular year, and usually from up to seven or eight different countries. So it's quite a multinational fishery. Um, this uh, plot here shows the, the catch history. The, the white is the, the catch, and the blue is the, the TAC. So um, it really took until 2005 before the, before the TAC was reached for the first time, and since then the catches are averaged around 3,000 tonnes a year. Um, and it's an austral summer fishery, so um, it really starts 1st of December and, and might go through till uh, the end of February. Um, in recent years, the, the season's been getting shorter and shorter as the vessels have become better um, adapted at, um, and more experienced in catching the fish. 
Um, so the whole area is really covered in ice for, for probably nine months of the year. Um, so in terms of the, the management, um, Kamla sets uh, an annual catch limit. Um, it's currently set at around uh, 2,800 uh, tons per year. Um, it includes quite a, quite a large closed area down there, a number of closed areas, in fact. Um, there's additional catch limits for, for bycat species. Um, the bycat species are mainly McCrurids and um, uh, skates. Um, and all the, every vessel has to have a, a national observer and an international observer on board, so there's very good observer coverage. Um, all vessel positions are monitored using a satellite monitoring system, and, and those positions are relayed back to uh, the Camelot Secretariat so they can keep an eye on what's happening. Um, it's a catch documentation scheme, so that's set in place to try and stop that illegal, illegal fishing and illegal catches getting onto the market. Um, and there is an added value for you know, vessels which, uh, well, in fact, some markets will only take fish from a, a, a CDS certified scheme. Um, so it has helped. Um, this is amongst the most highly monitored, highly regulated, and, and data rich high seas uh, fisheries in the world. So, CAMLA management uh, goals are, are defined in, in Article 2 of the, the Convention. CAMLA has hundreds, well, it's probably 20 or 30 articles. Um, Article 2 is the main one which deals with harvesting uh, fish stocks. And the first one um, it deals primarily with the targeted fish stocks, so in, in this case, toothfish. Uh, the second and third ones are looking at the ecosystem effects of fishing, and I'll talk about those a bit later. So in terms of the harvested population, um, they must be maintained a level, above a level which ensures stable um, recruitment. And for something like toothfish, that, that level is defined at 50%. If you look at something like ice fish, which is an important prey species, then that's defined at about 75%. So that's a higher, keep that biomass at a higher level. Um, so um, when we go through and carry out a stock assessment, then we carry out projections of the stock and uh, we have a particular set of decision rules on which we base the, the TAC. So in, in this situation, if you just look at the, the blue line, um, this would indicate that the, the, the assessment of the stock covers this period from, say, 90, 1995 through to 2010. Um, so that's the current estimate here. And then when you carry out your projection, you carry out, you project the, the current stock status out for 35 years um, so that using, by, by calculating a catch, which would allow that population to decline to 50% of the original level. Okay, so it was up here, sorry, it was up here, and then it's taken down to 50%. Um, so a 35-year projection is a pretty long period of time, <laughs> but obviously the, um, the assessment's updated every year or, or two years. So it could be considered as reasonably conservative. Um, the second aspect of this is the total biomass. So the total biomass is uh, dropping down, in this instance, to about 64%. So the 50% um, only defines, it's only concerning the spawning stock biomass itself. So why have we got a target reduction of 50%? Uh, well, many fishery management regimes uh, are based on MSY. And uh, for MSY, the target level is somewhere between 20 and 35% B0, which is not very conservative. Um, and recently, around the world, globally, fisheries organizations realized that you really want to keep the spawning stock biomass a, a little bit higher to ensure that recruitment's maintained. Um, so Camla chose a 50% biomass target, which is quite conservative compared to other organizations and, and nations, governments around the world. Um, and the reason is to make sure that the recruitment is, is remained high. So this is called a, a stock recruit relationship, which is anybody who's, who's done it 101 fisheries knows very well. Um, so you've got stock or the biomass on this side and you've got recruitment on the, on the y-axis. Um, so at, a, at a, uh, a virgin stock of 100% of the virgin level, um, you've got 100% recruitment. As you fish down the stock, the recruitment follows this particular line. Okay, so once you get down to, to this end, below about 20% of the, of the virgin level, then you can really start affecting recruitment. It's an area you don't want to go at all. Um, so Camla has chosen this particular area here where recruitment is relatively unaffected. It should be still around 90% of the original level. And it's un it's unaffected. they believe it's unaffected because 
fish produce so many eggs and larvae that even if you fish the bar mass down to 50%, then you're still getting a lot of eggs and larvae going out into the, into the water column, which can survive. Okay, so um, to achieve the requirements of, of Article 2, uh, we require knowledge of a number of things. We need um, catches, so you've already seen the, um, the catch history, but we also need to have an idea of what the IUU catches are. Uh, we need to know the stock structure, um, productivity, so the productivity, things like looking at the growth rates, the reproduction, what size the fish mature at, um, natural mortality rates, so what proportion of the fish die of old age or, or, or are predated on. Um, and then we need to know estimates of abundance and how those estimates of, ab of abundance are changing through time. And lastly, we need to know the ecosystem effects of fishing. So um, IUU catches uh, within the Rossi region are considered to be very low. They've been about estimated to be around 600 tonnes or so for the, uh, the duration of the fishery. Um, and this is probably because we have very regular um, New Zealand Orion flights overhead and also Navy patrols. Um, the area is covered by ice for up to, up to nine months of the year which offers a lot of protection. Um, and we've also got a, a fleet of legal vessels down there. And so the legal vessels themselves are looking out for um, illegal boats. Um, however, there's still cause for concern. There was a, um, three vessels found uh, fishing to the west of the Ross Sea region in East Antarctica um, in January 2015. And then the Sea Shepherd which was down there looking for um, toothfish vessels, uh, found two further ones and gave chase and followed one all the way up to, to um, the west coast of Africa, at which point the, the skipper scuttled the boat. Um, the, uh, of these five boats that we that were seen in 2015, there's only one that's, that's still operating. Um, various others have been scuttled or, or uh, dismantled. Um, and if anybody wants a, a good read, um, there's a great book on IUU fishing called Hooked by Bruce Necht, and that follows a, a chase of an tooth, illegal toothfish boat by an Australian Navy um, probably 10 years ago now. Um, so that's a good read. Okay, so um, the catches in the fishery um, are shown here. So the, um, the red and the... Uh, well, this, is, this shows the, the scale for, for catches over the entire period of the fishery. So if you look at the reds and the oranges and the greens, they're really high along here. This is the, the Ross Sea slope. Um, so this contour is at around 1,000 metres. Um, there's also quite high catches up here in these um, sort of ridges and region of ridges and hills and sea mounts up in the north of the Ross Sea. Um, and some also some catches in, in here in Turnover Bay. So um, since 2005, 2005 um, the area to the, to the west of, of this line here has all been closed to fishing. Uh, in fact, this area was closed in about 2008. Um, and, and this area here as well has been closed since, um, since 2005. So quite a big chunk of the area has, has, has seen very, very little fishing at all. Um, so the main drivers of, of toothfish are the, um, are the depth. Um, and they occur mainly between 600 and 1,800 metres, although they have been caught down to about 2,500 metres. Um, and they don't really occur here. These are all shallow, shallow banks in here, um, which come up to within two or 300 metres um, from the surface. Um, so the other main factors affecting the catches are the are sea ice. So there's very, very difficult sea ice conditions down there from year to year, um, which also affects the access of the vessels. So this uh, figure here shows the proportion of toothfish by, by length class uh, in the catch. So I've divided it up into three. The green is the immature fish. The blue is maturing fish, which are sort of between 100 and 130. And then the pinks are the mature fish. Um, so the northern, uh, the, the immature fish rather, occur mainly in the, in the southern part of the shelf um, and the central shelf itself. As they get a bit bigger, they tend to be found uh, further to the west in um, Terranova Bay, which is over in, over in this area um, and, and throughout that sort of central uh, region. Um, and then um, as they get bigger again, they're found up in the north primarily, up in those northern banks and, and sea mounts. Um, 
Because it's a, a, a summer fishery, um, we get very little information on the reproductive status of those fish. So the fish which occurred up in the north um, have uh, their reproductive status is, is um, um, sort of developing gonads. The, the uh, ovaries, for example, might be sort of four or five percent of the, of the body weight. So they're still quite small for tooth, in toothfish standards. Um, so we really wanted to find out when those toothfish were spawning. The Patagonian toothfish we knew spawned during the winter months. Um, so we really wanted to try and get down there in the winter to find out if that was when, where and when those fish were spawning. Um, so after badgering um, Kamla for, for, for several years, they finally relented and agreed to um, set aside catch for a, a single New, Sp New Zealand vessel to go down to, the, to those northern hills during the winter months and, and do a winter survey. And it was really exciting. It was a really successful trip. They, um, they found large numbers of spawning females in, in June, um, females and males. And the uh, figure here shows the, uh, the GSI index. So the GSI is, is the percentage of the gonad weight over the total weight of the fish. So the maximum, the maximum um, gonad weight or the, or the GSI index was around 35%, which is incredible. You know, a third, third of the body weight was, was, um, was reproductive material. It's almost like salmon. Um, and um, a lot of the fish were in that 10 to 20% 10 to range. Um, so um, the, we had a, a couple of scientists on board, one from, from Italy and one from New Zealand, and they managed to successfully um, um, strip the, the males and females and fertilize the eggs and um, managed to rear the eggs on board the vessel for, for four days. And this shows the um, development stages of those. That's the first time that we've ever seen Antarctic eggs and that development of, of those eggs. Um, the other thing they did was to place these eggs in a, in a buoyancy chamber, which you can see here on the right. Now, the idea of that was to find out what the density was of those fertilized eggs and how that changed through time. Um, so they have uh, floats of known density. So these yellow dots here were, were floats which they knew what density they were. Um, they then introduced these eggs into the uh, chamber and, and followed them over a period of, of uh, two or three days. Um, now, they, we'd also done CTD, CTD casts on the vessel, so we knew what the density of the water is. And so we could match the density of the eggs with the density of the water to find out whether the eggs would be buoyant or, or, or neutrally buoyant or sink. And we found to our surprise that they would have been quite positively buoyant. And, and over a matter of probably a few days, that those eggs, even though they spawn quite deep, would actually come right up towards the surface and probably be in the, in the upper sort of 50 to 100 meters. Um, and the other thing, that, other cool thing that we did was to carry out plankton tows. Um, and so the plankton tows, we started off doing vertical hauls, but then we tried doing some, some horizontal trawls as well, um, using a fine mesh plankton net. And we caught uh, 19 toothfish eggs, which was, the, again, the first time the toothfish eggs had been caught in the, in the wild. So, um, and those have now been correctly uh, identified as being belonging to Antarctic toothfish. So we've got a, a really good idea now way of, of where those fish are spawning and what time of the year they're spawning. Okay, um, so the next thing to do was to um, work out if the eggs were spawned in those areas. And the, um, uh, this was the area we actually did the survey up here. That was as far south as they could get. So if they were spawned in those areas at that particular depth, where would they end up? Um, now, um, Joe was talking earlier on about the Antarctic circumpolar current, which is a very strong current which flows west to east around this area here. But because of the embayment caused by the Ross Sea, we've got this Ross Gyre. And so the water circulation takes these eggs up to the east and, and, then, and then entrains them into the Ross Gyre, and then, which comes down to the Antarctic coast. Um, and you're looking at about between one and one and a half and two years before these eggs come, would come down and hit the Antarctic coast. That seems a little bit long for um, for development. We know that the eggs probably take about six months to um, to hatch, and I guess once the eggs have hatched into larvae, then the larvae will be able to to move themselves um, a little bit faster. Um, um, so. 
the next thing we did was to look at to see whether the catch rates of, of juvenile fish were caught in the in the fishery. So um, the fishery doesn't really catch fish much smaller than about 40 to 50 centimetres, but we found that fish between about 40 and, and 80 are, are mainly found out here in the Amundsen Sea. So that's the Ross Sea here. This is the Amundsen Sea region, which is pretty much where the eggs and larvae were, were coming down from the, from the current. So, um, so it looks like the, the eggs and larvae, they come down and hit the Antarctic coast in the Amundsen Sea. They probably settle out there. The, um, the juveniles are, are negatively buoyant, so they're probably staying near the, near the bottom. Growing up, they might stay there for three or four years and then migrate um, along the um, Ross Sea shelf into the southern Ross Sea region. So settling out here, coming along here, occurring, living in these um, areas. These are quite deep areas or holes caused by the um, depression because of the ice on the, on the shelf. Um, as the fish grow a bit older, they, they migrate through to Terranova Bay and out onto the, onto the slope where they're feeding. And then once they're large enough, they'll um, migrate up to the north, spawn. And we think that they're probably spawning there for, um, they might have two years up in the north. When we've done some reproductive work in the, in the summer months, they've got two series of eggs. So we think they probably spend two years in the north and spawning and then, and then migrate back. And we're not sure whether they migrate back um, straight to the, to the slope here or whether they might follow the eggs and larvae and, and drift around with the currents. Um, but that's been fairly well established now, that uh, life cycle. Um, the interesting thing is how they get from, from, uh, from the slope up, up to the north. And we think that uh, the, the fish down in the north, in, in the south rather, these big adult fish, they've got very large ovaries, very large gonads, so it's very likely that they are neutrally buoyant. And they probably uh, swim in, in, in mid-water across to these areas. However, once they've spawned, they lose an awful lot of that lipid tissue, and, and um, it's quite likely that at that stage they become negatively buoyant, although we're not sure um, that needs further work. Okay, so um, one of the other bits of information we needed to know was what the productivity of those fish is, the age and growth. So we use um, otoliths to age the, the fish. Um, this is a, an Antarctic toothfish otolith. It's been baked and then sectioned. Uh, you can see a, a mass of different rings. The otolith reader assures us that um, these are the main rings here, so you might be six or seven years old. Um, you can also read them in this direction. Um, so um, the aging itself has, has been validated using tetracycline and radioactive isotopes. And by aging, I mean that the, uh, the annual formation of these rings has been validated. So that was done, first of all, by, by injecting some of the fish with tetracycline and then counting the number of rings since the fish was, um, um, had been first injected and then, and then was recaptured. Um, so we've now aged around 12,000 fish. Um, most of the, um, you can see there's, although the maximum age is up around 50 years old, there's really not many fish which are older than, than around 30. And most of the mature fish sitting here between 15 and, and uh, 30 years old. <coughs> um, we've also done quite a lot of work on the sexual maturity of, of toothfish. Um, so we've uh, analysed around 2,000 um, gonads histologically, and from that we've calculated that the males are maturing at around 120 centimetres and 13 years, and females at um, around 16 years and 135 centimetres. Okay, so estimating toothfish abundance. Um, I, I love this quote from, from the famous UK fish scientist John Shepherd. Counting fish is just as easy as counting trees, except you can't see them and they move. Very true. <laughs> um, now, monitoring toothfish abundance is even harder um, because the area is just so remote. It's, uh, surveys are expensive. There's a lot of ice around, and, and the fish are widely dispersed. So it's, it's a challenge. Um, and in the early days, we investigated various methods. We looked at trawl surveys, and they were difficult because um, you might be able to catch small fish, but they didn't really seem to occur in the, in the, in the Ross Sea. Um, and the larger fish were, were hard to catch using, using trawl nets. There was bad ice conditions, rough bottom, and um, 
fragile benthic organisms, which people didn't really want to catch. Um, acoustic surveys are difficult because toothfish don't have a swim bladder, or at least they don't have a gas fuel swim bladder, so they're acoustically very hard to detect. Um, egg and larval surveys are impossible because, as I said before, the fish are spawning in winter. Um, and the commercial fishery catch and unit catch and effort data, the CPUE data, seem to be biased. So even though we've had a fishery there for 15 years, the CPUE really doesn't change very much. You know, it's gone down a little bit, but uh, nothing like what you'd expect. Um, so tagging experiments were chosen, and they're quite a good candidate for tagging. The, the fish come up in reasonably good condition from the, from the line, um, so there's no swim bladder. Uh, the fish are handled individually, and also we could use an industry vessel to do the tagging. And in fact, um, the toothfish population is now monitored using a, a tag release and, and recapture experiment. Um, the New Zealand companies themselves, who were down there in, in the early years, actually initiated a toothfish tagging program um, in 2001 off their own bat. And that was quite unique, having a industry vessels actually tagging fish and putting them back in the water um, <laughs> off their own bat. So. Um, so tagging became a requirement of CAMLA in, in 2004, and part of that protocol is that all fish must be double tagged uh, with T-bar tags, and they have to tag them at the rate of one tag per ton. So every boat that goes down there, if they catch 200 tons or 500 tons, they have to tag and release that many fish. And we've got observers on board to make sure that that gets done. Um, and then we also have a, a tag reward program um, to encourage recaptures. So um, we've now got over 45,000 tagged toothfish down there, although some have probably died, but uh, that's the number that have been tagged. And we've had around 2,400 recaptured. Um, we're still getting fish recaptured after 13 years at Liberty. So, so um, these are, this is the release year here, 2004. Start, well, we started a little bit earlier, but um, 2004 here, we had 2,000 releases. And these are the recaptures for each year from those releases. So, you know, we're still getting four fish caught last year, which, which have been at, at liberty for 13 years. Um, so the, um, uh, the, the, there's quite a bit of variation in, 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 re in recaptures by year, as you can see here. And part of that is relates to the location of fishing. So some areas, there's probably more tags being put in the water than, than others. And, and ice does restrict the, lo the fishing locations. Um, so within the model, we, we assume a 10% a, a mortality rate of, of the tagged fish, um, and that's based on some fairly crude tank experiments which were carried out in, in the early years, but that's the only data we have at the moment. Um, we assume detection rates close to 100%, and because we have uh, double tag, every fish is double tagged, we can estimate the tag loss rate of those fish. Um, and when we started looking at the data, we noticed that some vessels weren't really doing a very good job at tagging. So they were getting, they, they might tag in a, a number of fish in, in the water, but we weren't getting a lot of their tags back. So we developed a, a case control method to correct for that um, poor tagging performance, if you like. Um, so it essentially downweights the information that comes from those vessels. Um, so we also look at the age structure of the, the toothfish. So um, these are the data from the, uh, the shelf fisheries, the slope fishery here and the, and the north fishery here. Um, and as you'd expect from the size distributions, we're getting sort of five to 15 year old fish here, um, 10 to 20 years old here and, and 15 to, to um, 30 years old there. Um, and the other piece of information that we use in our, in our assessments a, um, is a research survey of, of young fish. So we started this, um, it's actually a long line survey, a uh, standardized long line survey, so using the same sort of gear every year, the same vessel um, at different locations. And um, we started this because we're concerned that um, because they're quite late maturing and late selected by the fishery, we were concerned that if the fish started to, population started to decrease rapidly, then it would be quite a number of years before we realized it. So we, we thought, well, we need to have some um, early warning system of, of changes in recruitment. Um, so the patterns so far have been quite interesting. Uh, since 2012, we had quite a decline in the, in the catch rate or relative abundance of small fish in the, in the Ross Sea. And then um, we had a big increase in 2016 and 2017. 
And when you look at the, the age data here, we can see that there was quite a strong year class or cohort here in 2012, which, which slowly declined. You can see it moving through, but it declined in numbers going through to 2017. Um, and then there was an increase here of a new cohort uh, in 2016, again, coming through to 2017. So um, we believe that's um, monitoring abundance reasonably well. Um, and it's allowing us to get some estimates of recruitment variability and recruitment autocorrelation, which we can put into those uh, fisheries modeling, particularly for the um, projections. So that all goes together to a stock assessment. Um, I won't go into detail in the, in the, in the, about the assessment itself. It's a fairly, in, fairly standard integrated stock assessment. Uh, integrates the catch data, the tag recapture data, age frequency data, and the recru recruitment surveys. Um, yeah, I think the other details you can, you can look at. You can ask me about it later if you're interested. Um, and so that's the results of the, um, of the assessment. This is the most recent assessment that was just done a couple of months ago. Um, so the sp spawning stop biomass at the moment is estimated to be at around 50,000 tonnes and about 70% of the pre-exploitation level. Um, and so those projections that we did suggest a, a catch of around 3,200 tonnes would, um, uh, would allow the biomass to, to hit the target in 35 years. Okay, so um, what about the effects on the rest of the ecosystem? So um, the other two parts of the Article 2 look at ecological relationships, so who eats who, really, making sure that those relationships are maintained. Um, and also uh, preventing risk of big changes in the marine ecosystem. Um, so food web relationships are pretty complex, um, as we can see from the variancy as well. Um, so the, uh, this has got trophic level up on the left. Um, I mean, the Antarctic is supposed to be a simple ecosystem, but really <laughs> there's an awful lot happening there as well. So Antarctic toothfish at the top here, they're at the top trophic level along with um, killer whales and uh, Weddell seals. Um, so that's a bit complicated to think about. So we've simplified it down to a, a fairly basic uh, food web. Um, and really, so far, we've just been looking at the, um, the areas um, highlighted. So toothfish, they've been basically feeding on fish. They're sort of 95% piscivores. Um, and they're being predated on possibly by Weddell seals and, and um, toothed whales. So um, we've examined over 10,000 stomachs now, um, and the toothfish are mainly feeding on the grenadier, so that's the Whitson's grenadier, and also ice fish, and in particular the kind of Athascus dewitti, sea dewitti. Um, so although it's feeding mainly on these two species, um, those two species are also being taken in the catch. So we carried out some modelling using a, a very basic ecosystem model, a, a minimum realistic model, um, which suggested that the most likely consequence of the toothfish fishery was a localised increase in the abundance of, of those two species on the, on the Ross Sea Slope. So that's an area that we've, we're interested in now in, in trying to monitor to see if we can pick up any change. Um, the other aspects of it were the, um, the ecological role of toothfish as, as a prey. So we know that Weddell seals and, and type C killer whales are both known to eat toothfish. Again, it's another video that hasn't worked, but there's a toothfish there. This was a, a fishing hole, and a Weddell seal popped up with a toothfish in its mouth and was busy um, dismembering it. Um, and that's a killer whale with a, with a toothfish in its mouth as well. Um, so, um, so the ecosystem modelling that we've done, and using those, you know, that, that original model, large-scale model, um, we found that um, toothfish don't appear to be a major prey item for um, for those species in the Ross Sea region, um, but they could be important uh, in particular locations, such as in the southwest of the Ross Sea shelf. Um, but the importance of toothfish as a prey is really, really difficult to quantify because um, it depends on a whole bunch of things. Um, so the key areas that have been identified as being important are, are down here. This is um, McMurdo Sound. This is where Arts, um, Art de Vries and, and um, Joe Eastman have done a lot of their work. But also here in Terranova Bay, which where there's an Italian base. Um, and these two strata here, incidentally, are, are where we do the, um, the, the, the survey of the young fish. So they're right next to the, 
uh, McMurdo. So we're very fortunate that at McMurdo Sound, um, we've, ha we've had quite a long time series of, of fishing studies that have been carried out there by, by US scientists. And there were studies which were aimed at uh, collecting toothfish for physiological work. So Art de Vries did a lot of the early antifreeze work down there at McMurdo Sound on fish caught from uh, through the ice. Um, so fortress, luckily they, they were recording numbers of toothfish um, per, per hook. Um, during the time that they were fishing there. And you can see since, um, what, since 1975, the, the numbers of fish sort of varied quite a bit. These are numbers of fish per hook, and I think they were fishing sort of 20 to 30 hooks on a, on a, on a line, a vertical long line. Um, so look, things are looking pretty good up to around 2000. And then after that, there was a really big drop in, in decline in, in the numbers of uh, toothfish they were catching. So 2006 through to 2012 or so, they were getting very, very few fish. And at that stage, there was a lot of concern that um, the toothfish fishery might be having an impact on, on these larger toothfish which were occurring at McMurdo Sound. And the, I guess the hypothesis was that if you take fish away from the, the slope area and start fishing them quite hard, then you might get a range contraction. And so toothfish would be less abundant in the McMurdo Sound region. Um, but there was quite a lot of concern, so a colleague of mine, um, Steve Parker, went down with Art de Vries, who was one of the earlier fishers, and another colleague, and they did some fishing at, at three sites um, down here on in McMurdo Sand itself. Um, and they managed to catch about 20 or so uh, toothfish, quite a few at this site here, which is a little bit deeper, and I think one or two at this site here. So it looked like there were still some large toothfish there. Um, and then in 2015, we, we went back and um, for about two weeks, and I think we caught about 200 very large toothfish down there. So it does look like the uh, the numbers of toothfish are are similar now to what they were at historical levels. Um, we're not quite sure of the reason for this for this decline in this period. Um, there was a a very large iceberg that came off from the ice shelf and blocked the entrance to the sound up here. And as a consequence, this whole area froze over and, and, and didn't uh, break out for about 10 years. So that might have had some impact. Um, and because of the ice there, they also had to move the, the, the ice runway at Momodo Sound Station. And so the, um, the fishing location had to be changed a bit as well. So, OK. Um, so the ecosystem effects of the fishery uh, are within the limits specified by Article 2 of the Convention. Um, they tend to be more precautionary than, than, than exist for fishery management organizations around the world. Um, we've got a lot of research going on to try and um, understand the ecosystem better, to do surveys of the slope, to try and get an understanding of any changes in, in dynamics of toothfish and the prey, and also monitoring um, the toothfish at McMurdo Sound and, and um, Turnover Bay. So lastly, conservation. Um, I mentioned earlier there has been closed areas in the Ross Sea almost since the start of the fishery. Um, so these grey areas have been closed and also this pink area here which is depths less than 550 metres have been closed as well since 2005. So, so there was really quite a restricted area for fishing even before the MPA sort of came into, into thinking. Um, nevertheless in 2010 the New Zealand and the US governments started developing a, an MPA proposal um, and the coloured shapes on this figure, which is <laughs> uh, there's about 27 of them, um, they encompass the distributions of species which they were trying to protect. So we did a, a, a series of uh, bioregionalizations. We did a benthic bioregionalization, a pelagic bioregionalization. We looked at uh, important predator species, important prey species, mapped out distributions, and then decided which ones were the most important ones. So we had 27 protection objectives, and then they started deciding. You know what what boundaries you could draw to maximise the best protection of of those species. So the purple the purple line here shows the boundary of the original um, MPA. Um, so for example, with Antarctic silverfish, um, this is a key species. Um, you see here, it's eaten on it's eaten by practically everything in the in the Ross Sea. It's a really really major prey item. Um, the distribution of it is is here in the blue. And the MPA um, covered about 95% of its distribution, so that was doing pretty well. Um, 
similar situation for uh, toothfish predators, so the, uh, the Weddell seals, which are shown there in orange, and the type C killer whale, which are in green there, their feeding areas uh, are, are very well protected by the MPA as well. Um, so the proposal went up to Kamla in 2012, and um, much to everyone's dismay, it, it got knocked back, and we tried again in 2013 and 14 and 15, and um, every year there was someone who held out predominantly Russia, but um, Korea at times in China. Um, and then finally last year um, we had success and the um, MPA was finally agreed. And this is what it looks like. Um, so it goes into place in 1st of December um, 2017. Uh, so we've got full protection for the Bellini Islands, this area out to the west here, um, uh, for the whole of the Ross Sea Shelf region here. Um, and end up here for the eastern um, slope. Um, this, you've got partial protection for the, um, the krill research zone, which is, which is in here, and for the um, toothfish research zone. So those areas would, would allow some fishing, but, but not, um, you know, it's not fully protected, but it does allow some fishing. And um, it's over 1.6 million square kilometres, so Again, <laughs> as you said, you know, the, uh, it's about a uh, very similar size to the Barents Sea, isn't it? Um, so it's the largest marine protected area in the world and um, about four times the landmass of, of Sweden. So it's pretty exciting. That's a really major achievement. It took a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of people flying around the world. <laughs> um, so conclusions. So does Kamla balance conservation with, with rational use? Um, so I conclude that the, the toothfish fishery is being sustainably fished. Um, we've got good monitoring systems in place for, for adults and recruitment. And the stock is, is currently well above the uh, precautionary target level. We can't really make such a strong statement about the ecosystem effects of fishing because you know, it is very complex. It's very hard to, to know. We've done quite a lot of work on ecosystem modelling. We've identified species which might be vulnerable to fishing and um, through trophic cascades, through, through direct predator-prey interactions. Um, and where possible, we've got monitoring systems in place. But unfortunately, it costs a lot of money to get down there and, and New Zealand government doesn't seem to be very rich. At least it doesn't want to spend money on, on Antarctic research. So, um, But uh, we have got some, uh, we have just been awarded a, a four-year program to at least do some of the uh, surveys on the slope, which is pretty encouraging. Um, and I didn't mention, but part of the MPA is you need to have a very strong monitoring and um, evaluation program in place. So, you know, it's, it's, it's up for review every 10 years, and if you're not doing your monitoring, if you're not doing your research down there, then there's every chance that someone will try and pull it out. So it is important that money gets spent on, on research there. Um, We've also had um, two independent auditing bodies, the Marine Stewardship Council and the Monterey Bay Aquarium. They've both um, certified the fishery as being sustainable. Um, spatial management uh, included quite large areas before the, before the, um, since the start of the fishery and with the introduction of the NPA, um, I think we can say that Cam and I are doing a, a reasonably good job of balancing conservation with rational use in this area. So again, just acknowledgements to colleagues and funding agencies and um, observers and industry and everything else. So thanks very much. <laughs> okay. mm.